112, but I think there's some great stuff here. So John chapter 12, and we want to really zero in on the 24th verse, because that's the key one, don't you think, in this chapter? Verily, verily, I say unto you. It's on. This is dismiss the kids. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. You kids don't want to stay? Go. Stay. Sorry about that. Thank you for the reminder. See you guys. Bye. Bye. So cute. All right. Shall I begin again? John 12, verse 24. It's about a seed, right? It says a corn wheat. It means a seed, a wheat seed, a grain seed. Except a, a seed fall into the ground and dies. In other words, Except the seed gets planted, it abides alone. It, it's meaningless. It's useless. Nothing happens. But if it dies, if it gets planted, it brings forth much fruit. Have you ever planted a seed? Flower seed? A uh, vegetable seed? You plant one seed and you get more than one, right? You get... For instance, if you plant a tomato seed, you get a, a tomato stalk that bears several tomatoes. And in that, each tomato, there's a whole bunch of seeds as well. That's the picture. You know, in the beginning, when God created, he made land to sprout up with vegetation. Every seed-bearing plant and, and tree that grows seed-bearing fruit, he made to produce or reproduce the kind of plants and trees from which each came from. And that remarkable cycle that God put into the vegetable kingdom, he uses here in verse 24 to illustrate the principle of godly living. And he, Jesus presents himself as the perfect example of that. And here is the principle that out of death, out of self-sacrifice, out of absolute surrender to God, springs forth the greatest blessing more than you can even imagine, more than can be measured. You know, there are people that... Uh, believed God, loved God, served God, and now they're with God in glory. But you know, the seed that they sowed of their life in ministry, in serving the Lord, it's still bearing fruit. Isn't that amazing? And the tale isn't told. The story's not over. The last chapter hasn't been written until we all get to heaven and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So this is a wonderful principle, and it's so counterintuitive. It's so paradoxical that when something dies, life springs from it. Usually, when something dies, we think, that's the end of it, it's over. But in the vegetation kingdom and in this kingdom of God, when something dies to itself, life and blessing flows out of it. It's an amazing thing. And that's what he's talking about in John 12, 24. Look at the verse just before, it, verse 23. Uh, Jesus, in his answer to the Greeks that came wanting a private interview with him, Sirs, we would see Jesus. He answers Andrew and Philip, and he says, You know, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. 
what hour is he talking about? When he says the hour is come, you know hour he's meaning? He's talking about his death by crucifixion. And notice how he couches that. He says, the hour or my death is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That death is going to be the way in which Jesus will be glorified. Isn't that amazing? Because in his death, like the life that is inside of a seed and springs forth when that seed is planted and dies underground, like that when Jesus is dead and buried, it will reveal to the world his real character and the attributes that were hidden in his earthly life previously. It's in a seed's burying, in a seed's death, that uh, it releases its fruit and it releases its beauty that was always contained in it. And so here's the principle for you and I. If you're a believer, your life is like a seed. Believers are like seeds. We're small. Seeds are small. We're insignificant. Seeds are kind of insignificant. In fact, if a seed is never planted, it's meaningless. It has no purpose. For its existence. A seed is meaningless and purposeless and useless until you plant it in the ground. And Christian lives are like seeds. And it's only when our small, insignificant life, which has God's life in it, like a seed has the life of a plant in it, our lives like seeds have God's life in it. And when we yield our lives to God, that's like planting them. It's what Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. And what he means by that is, I am letting go of everything that I want for myself. And I am embracing everything that God wants in me, for me. What he wants to do in my life, that's what it means to die to self. That's what it means to be buried. That's what it means to be planted. That's what it means to have your life like a seed planted. And in that yielding, that crucified life, that surrendering to the will of God, that surrendering your life to whatever God wants to do with it, there bursts forth out of that the life of Christ, which is a life of victory over sin and which is a life of fruitfulness in whatever God calls you to do. Just like we said, when Judas saw that expensive perfume poured out on Jesus' feet by Mary, he said basically, what a waste. You know, that could have been sold. That's a year's worth of, of wages. That could have been sold, and we could have used that money a better in a better way than just pouring it out on his feet. What a waste. Jesus says, no, it's actually the opposite. When you look at your life and you pour it out in surrender and devotion and love to Jesus, it's never a waste. It makes it purposeful. It makes it useful. It makes it eternal. Listen to this. In the uh, 25th verse, he that hateth his life, or rather surrenders, surrenders it, plants it, buries it in the will of God, he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. First point I want to share is simply this. The seed, your life, when it's surrendered in self-sacrifice to the Lord, it brings about glorification. Jesus said, when I give my life in death, it's going to be glorification. Same thing stands true in our lives. Our lives not only glorify the Lord when we give them up to him, when we surrender them to him, 
but in all eternity, they'll be reflecting the glory of God. Our lives will be glorified forever. Look at verse 24. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, except a seed, a corn or grain of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. See the word alone? God made us for more than ourselves. When you study the scripture, you know what the Bible is about? Someone said that the Bible is God's love letter to mankind. Do you know why it is that? Because God longs for fellowship. Did you know that God created human beings because God wanted to he wanted to lavish his love on human beings. The love that already existed for all eternity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit couldn't be contained. And so he brought forth creation so that love could be lavished upon us, human beings. God loves and longs for fellowship. But did you know that the only way that fellowship can take place is through the self-sacrifice of a person for the one that they love. For God so loved the world. The only way that that could happen was that he would give his only begotten son. God longs for fellowship and God longs to lavish his love upon us. But the only way that that could happen is through self-sacrifice. You know, lonely people, a seed, if it's not planted, if it's not, if your life isn't given back to God, it just abides alone. It stays small and insignificant and purposeless and useless and meaningless. There are people today that are committing suicide because they don't feel like they have any purpose or meaning in life. And it's not because, and they're lonely. And you know why they're alone? You know why they're lonely? Because they're blaming everyone else for failing them when they have failed to bury their lives. They have failed to surrender their lives to the Lord and thus be joined in a loving fellowship with him that will, that will bring about fullness and satisfaction in life that they would never otherwise experience. Blaming everyone else, but because they themselves are unwilling to fall into the ground and die, so to speak, and self-surrender to the Lord. By the way, that's the cure for loneliness. And you can be lonely in a crowd. And the cure for loneliness is self-sacrificing to God for others. To sacrifice yourself to God for others. That's the cure for loneliness. One of the worst things that grieving people can do when they, they lose perhaps a, a, a loved one is just to withdraw from everyone and just sit and sulk and, and pity themselves. The best thing that a person can do when they're grieving like that is to, is to dedicate themselves to the Lord to minister to others. And you forget about yourself. And you have the blessing of planting your life and seeing fruitfulness come from it. So the seed that's planted, it results in glorification, but it also results in fellowship, according to that 24th verse. Look at verse 24 again. If it's planted, he said, if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. When you surrender your life to God, not only is there glorification and fellowship, but there's fruitfulness. Much fruit, he calls it. And Jesus envisions in his own death, in the planting of his own life in death, in obedience to the Father, that he is going to reap a plentiful harvest. In fact, you remember how he viewed that spiritual harvest? He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're, they're ripe already to harvest. And he says, you know, the harvest truly is plenteous. The harvest is truly plenteous. 
So Jesus is envisioning through his death that he is going to reap a plenteous harvest. A great multitude, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, will be gathered around the throne and they will be people from every tongue, tribe, and nation that will be praising the Lord and they are part of that great harvest that is the result of him being planted in the earth in death and sacrifice for us comes fruitfulness. For a believer to be spiritually fruitful. If you want to be a spiritually fruitful believer, then you need to be willing to let God prune your life, to cut away from your life, to cut out of your life, whatever or whoever hinders that free flow of the life of Jesus that is within you. Remember, you're a seed. And like a seed has... The, the plant life stored within it that comes out after that seed is planted and dies. When you die the self, when you surrender fully to the Lord, what happens is that life of Christ can then be released through your life. And there is a free flowing then of Christ in you. Christ's life in you flows out from you, and that makes you fruitful. Verse 25 is the last thing I want to say, where he says, he that loves his life, that is, holds on to it, refuses to plant it. If you want to hold on to your little seed life, you're going to buy it alone. He says, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. If you hold on to your life and you refuse to surrender your life to the Lord, you end up wasting it. It becomes useless wasted, you lose it. Nothing to show for it. However, in reverse, if you bury your life, if you let God plant your life, if you surrender your life, verse 25 says, you're going to keep it unto life eternal. Here's the fourth thing about the seed. When the seed's planted, there's glorification. When the seed's planted, it results in fellowship. When the seed of your Christian life is planted, it becomes a fruitful life. When the seed is planted, life bursts forth from it. Jesus chose death because he knew that he was going to conquer death and uh, that only through the grave could he achieve resurrection and ascension and the throne where he is seated. The pathway to full, meaningful, purposeful, useful, fruitful, blessed life is simply this. You ready for it? Get out your tools and build an altar. I mean spiritually. Build an altar. Build an altar in which you are willing to lay first and foremost yourself upon that altar. And altars are for death. Altars are for self-sacrifice. Altars are for sacrifice. And this is an altar that you build, that you offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice. So build an altar. You want to be the seed that is uh, fruitful, that is full of meaning and purpose and usefulness and not waste your life, build an altar upon which you lay yourself. And when you lay yourself on that altar, you also lay all your relationships on that altar, all the people that you love. And you also lay on that altar all the things that you love. You lay it all on the altar. And you lay your desires on the altar. You lay the dreams that you have on the altar. You lay your choices on that altar. And you grab the knife and you kill it all. You kill them all off. And you offer them up as a costly, loving sacrifice to God. 
I think one of the first jobs I ever had was a sales job when I was just a, a little kid. I looked through magazines to find things that I could do to earn money. I remember I was looking, I don't remember the magazines, but I found a little ad in the back of a magazine that you could sell seeds and you could uh, earn prizes as a result of selling seeds. Well, I wanted, I wanted a baseball glove really bad and I didn't have the money for that. And so I sent off to, you ready for this? The Burpee Seed Company, B-U-R-P-E-E. -E. I sent off to the Burpee Seed Company. And I asked them to send me a box of Burpee Seeds. And, uh, and I wanted as many as was needed to sell in order to, uh, to uh, get the baseball glove. So that was one of the first things I did as a job. I remember going door to door, selling seeds, little packets of seeds. You've seen them at Home Depot or, or Duty's Hardware, little packets, paper packets of seeds that you plant in your flower garden or, or in your vegetable garden. So there's a, a little bag that has some seeds in it. Now, if a person buys those seeds, and those seeds, uh, they just... Uh, put them in a drawer, and they just sit they there, die. what good are they? <laughs> they? They do no good. They could buy the whole box of my seeds, but if they just put the box in the basement, never did anything with them, they're no good. They're only good when that pack is opened and you take out seeds one by one and you plant them carefully into the dirt and then cover them over so that they sprout and then bring forth fruit or flower, whatever. Nothing happens to them in the pouch. You know what I'm afraid? I'm afraid that a church like this is like a burpee seed pouch. Got a lot of seeds around here. But what good is it if these seeds aren't planted in self-sacrifice and surrender to the Lord? Nothing happens. Church doesn't grow. Nothing grows until it's planted, until there's that spiritual death process where you say no to self and you say a full yes to God. You know, in Israel, it's interesting. I like archaeology, especially Israeli archaeology. And uh, they have found seeds in excavation like let's say a seed from an olive that is uh, a couple of thousand years old that if planted it could grow an olive plant or a fig plant whatever did you know that in Israel there are trees that uh, have been uh, that are the descendants of of trees that are at least 2,000 years old in what is called the Garden of Gethsemane. In that area, there's all kinds of olive trees. And many of them are the descendants of the ancient olive trees that were in that garden when Jesus walked the earth. You see, when, you, when as Jesus says, when a seed or a, a, a grain or a, a corn of wheat falls into the ground and, and dies, is planted in the ground, it will bring forth much fruit. And the fruit will be lasting. And that's what Jesus' death was about. And that's what he's calling us to do. Someone said the entrance fee into the Christian life is free. Because Jesus paid it by him being the seed that was planted in the ground. Someone said the interest fee in the Christian life is free. But the annual dues are all that you are and all that you have. Because you're expected then to surrender like him your whole life to him. And if you do so, there's glory. There's fruitfulness, there's fellowship, 
There's life eternal. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, 